Hey, I'm Dagny, and in this video, I want to discuss with you the concept and attempt at sustainability in fashion and business. In particular, from what I've been not only researching, but also experiencing while uh, developing a clothing brand, as well as in my own lifestyle, the different nuances or layers when you're comparing how the West in my opinion, how the West tries to maneuver it and how in Africa and possibly the global South are more living in it. Okay, so let's unpack that. First, when I'm talking about sustainability, um, we're primarily talking like the official definition for sustainability has to do with the environment and how your either your lifestyle or your business or however else you're existing is impacting the environment and impacting what kind of environment future generations will have to live in. And in the West, in particular, my frame of reference is the US. The terms sustainable, ethical, green, eco-friendly have been kind of like, for some years now, utilized a lot where everyone's packaging is like white or green and everyone has some sort of like green initiative of some kind that they are um, promoting or campaigning or trying to, to claim as part of their brand. And some of the issues I've seen as to why these initiatives or these attempts at being sustainable in such a business can sometimes feel like an oxymoron because in particular with fashion, the fashion industry is known to be like the most waste, one of the most wasteful industries on the planet. And to me, that means the list, the amount of things that would need to be fixed or changed it's like an endless list that can be really overwhelming. And when so-called small or medium businesses are uh, pushing for like their entire business is so-called sustainable. I can't help a question like, cause like I'm one of those who would like, who really believe in doing that for my own business. I can't help but feel like, yeah, that's, it's a great attempt or it's a great thought, but it doesn't really, it's, it's difficult to see whether it truly makes a difference or an impact compared to the bigger corporations that may not really be doing much in return, you know? So like, just because I don't throw anything in the ocean, but they continue throwing tons in the ocean like me not throwing one thing in the ocean, how does that make a difference? You know? So the, the more important thing that I have found is that like education actually is more important than slapping like certifications and stickers on your products claiming it's certified green, certified eco, certified leprechauns. Like none of that really makes any sense to your consumer unless they're like all into what these stickers mean. So for example, um, the life cycle of clothing, of like the clothing you're wearing right now, like do you know what happens to it when you're done with it? Like it's cool if you're someone who you can say that, yo, what I'm wearing right now, I got this 10 years ago and I'm still wearing it. And that's awesome, that's great. That means like you totally invested in a piece of clothing that was supposed to last. But that may not be, that's probably not the case or possibly not the case for your entire wardrobe. So let's say what you're wearing right now is something that it's possible maybe a few years down the line, you're gonna to need to get rid of it because either it's no longer your style, it does not fit you, or it's become raggedy. So it just looks like it should not be in your closet anymore. Do you know what happens to it when you get rid of it? Donating clothes, recycling clothes, um, 
is something that even I used to do a lot of and thought I was doing a good thing of like, oh, well, you know, somebody else can wear it and stuff like that. Or someone else can upcycle it and thrift it and things like that. It turns out though that, let's say in the US when you take your clothing to Goodwill or the Salvation Army or a thrift shop who's purchasing used clothing, majority of that stuff ends up not being like resold or actually into the home of somebody else there uh, to continue being used. Actually, it becomes a part of the secondhand clothing industry, which is industry that most may not even like see, yeah? So the secondhand clothing industry, sure, some of it stays in the US, but a large majority of it gets shipped out into other countries. So there's a, there's a stat which, and of course I did write an article about this, so I will link it up below and tell you about it so you can go deeper. But when it comes to secondhand clothing, like the, in 2019, the top um, Im importer of secondhand clothing was Ukraine. The third top importer of secondhand clothing uh, was Ghana. And specifically uh, in Ghana, that secondhand clothing, like it's millions of items of clo secondhand clothing like land in Ghana and about almost half of that ends up being discarded since some of it cannot be used, it's soiled, it's torn, whatever. So it can't, no one's going to take it. So where does that 50, almost 50% of that, where does it go? It's in, it's in the water, it's in the ocean, it's in the sand. It's just, it's just, it's just there. And when you take into account secondhand clothing usually is made out of a certain material. And that certain material is polyester. The reason why a lot of clothing can be made cheaply and you can get like new styles, a whole collection of like a hundred new styles every month is because it's being made out of polyester. Now it's funny because before when I would hear polyester, I would think like plastic. Like I thought, oh, so that's like what those yellow raincoats are made out of because they look like a rubber duck, like I figured that's it. But no, actually polyester can mimic a whole lot of other things. And um, when they get dumped, when they get dumped like that into the ground, basically, or at like a garbage dump, they, they're not very good for the environment. They kind of don't, the planet can't consume it or do anything with it. So it kind of just contaminates the environment it's dumped in, which then contaminates the water or the soil and things like that. And since we humans are reliant on the planet for those sorts of things, it ends up haunting those who are living there because then their water is contaminated and their soil is contaminated. And the, the domino effect or the ripple effect just continues with that. That's, that's what's been happening. So like, what should we do about it though? Like who cares? Like. Regarding what to do about that, I feel like, I feel like there's no one size fits all answer. So like in the West, what to do about it is, oh, we're raising awareness. And then we're having like initiatives to recycle or upcycle or having initiatives to um, create, create more products that are apparently good for the environment. So you have biodegradable, uh, packaging and you have natural, you use fabrics that are natural fibers or um, are not, or are not dyed with chemicals that are, that would contaminate the earth or create things that can be compostable because apparently everybody has a compostable thing in their backyard. Like th those are kind of like, those are the things that people be focusing on. And then I then, which like all of those are okay, um, but they kind of keep us in this loop of, but they, for me, I feel like they just kind of keep us in this loop of like, yo, but like what, what impact has you made? Have, have we made, what impact have we made though? Are we making any impact? Has there really been any, um, difference uh, that we can measure.
by pushing those sorts of things. This then takes me to compare to sustainability in fashion and business in the African context. So when I was still, when at the beginning point of me getting Bandele Muse off the ground, um, I kept on, uh, I kept on engaging in conversations about sustainability and how can I, from the jump, make sure that my business is sustainable or is not contributing to the demise of the planet, you know? And um, some people laughed at me because they were like, that's, that's very much an American thing. We don't do that. Uh, while others, I'm thankful, you know, actually paused and explained to me what that would mean in the African context. And then as I continued doing my work, I could also like see it and experience it in real time, what that means. So it's not so much about what fabric you're using, since you kind of can only use a fabric that is, at, that is accessible here. Sustainability in Africa is more about people and community. Well, then wouldn't that mean that's more ethics? Mm, kind of. Because technically speaking, sustainability in business, like the official definition, sustainability in business is about the environment. It's about animals. It's about um, those sorts of things. Well, ethics is about fair trade, fair wages, um, appropriate um, conditions for the people who are working or who are part of the supply chain. So we, we like, you know, in the official definitions tend to separate those two things. While I've taken note, like for the African context, no, those two things are one and the same. You don't just, you don't just think about your building should be really nice, but you don't do anything for the people that need to be in the building. It's like, no, that it's one and the same. You can't separate the two. Anyways, when you talk about it being more about people and community. It's more about, we need to create access because access is not available. So if you can build something that enables you to provide an appropriate living wage for people, that further enhances the value of the product, then that should, that, that should attract investment and even more businesses to further develop the industry and further develop those products and further develop the people who are attached to that industry and products. When you look at it in that way, isn't that an easier way to actually measure your sustainable initiatives? If one can say that because of what you're doing here, you can measure that this amount of people now can live a certain way or have jobs, or can put their kids through school, or um, can afford better health care, or because of that, or because of what you've built, investment has come in, so that whole community now can have access to proper health care and roads and things like that, all because of this homeware or fashion or food or you know whatever whatever the the product is in addition to that sustainability is also in the african context i found is also about how you choose to produce there is no like hyper consumer hyper produce a whole lot stuff kind of thing. It's it's more, because it's much more people oriented, one feels that it's more intentional because a lot of the stuff is, a lot of, a lot of stuff is still handmade and, it, and the techniques and methods are used are techniques that have been passed down for generations and generations. And so there's a lot more there's a lot more history, a lot more culture, a lot more intention around production compared to what we're doing with fast fashion at the moment. 
And this is without the special coded fabric and the special coded machinery and the special coded this, that, the other. Not saying those things are not good, but like, I, I feel like there needs to be a balance of the two for it to really work. Because, and now we're gonna compare the two, right? So like on the Western side, there's, yes, there is more innovation trying to recreate the wheel, trying to create new stuff that we can label as this is good for the environment and this is okay. But it, it's still very heavy on, but it's still relying heavily on machinery and um, the demand of hyper consumerism and the demand for needing budget friendly clothing all the time and, and going through multiple seasons and trends all the time throughout one year. Well, then on the African side, yes, it's more people oriented. Yes, it's more grounded and like, yo, all of us just got to eat. That is what being sustainable is about. If everybody's eating, then we are sustainable and it's fine. Y yes, yes. Um, but because it's so reliant on people, it has the... It also has the concern that when that one or a couple of people who are truly about it leave or drop off or have to stop, the whole thing stops because there was no, there's nothing automated or nothing that can continue regardless if that one person who's been talking about being sustainable and making sure everybody get paid ends up having to shift and do something else. And, and then when that happens, all of the people who were benefiting in a positive way, but does that all get canceled out? Or does it con can they continue without that one person or that group of people who were kind of spearheading it or leading it on? If you had a synergy of the two so that it could still con... Do you see how I'm... We might, I might be thinking too deep in this, but I just feel like there are, there are pros in both that if we could just like align those and then, which would then lay out where are the other holes as opposed to keeping them so separate. So we end up just remaining in the loop of we're, we're still not making as much of a difference as we could be. I'm really encouraged at the ideas and initiatives that I have been seeing. Like there's this platform called Common Objective where uh, if you're either a brand or a manufacturer or a supplier or whatever, but within the fashion industry who is um, committed or advocating sustainability and ethics and things like that. That is a place where one, there's resources for education, but also a, a community that you can uh, try to connect with or learn from or network with, or possibly even like work with. And I forget how I came up. I think I, it was just due to me diving into the topic for some months now. And the types of things that I see on there keeps me hopeful and encouraged that we are on the right track, like we're getting there. It's gonna take us some time, but we are getting there. Uh, that doesn't feel empty or doesn't feel like it's just marketing, but you're not really doing anything different. But again, even on that, it's a lot more, the community I see is a lot more either in the US or Europe, and then Asia, got a lot of India there, and then South America, and then that's kind of it. And then I see like on the African part, it's more brands as opposed to like manufacturers. Uh, and then there's a few suppliers, but still like, there could be more compared to what I'm seeing from what other countries are putting out on there. And maybe we'll get there. I believe we can, yes. But yeah, sorry for the, my jingle jingles, I'm feeling very creative because 
These are my Vandalay Muse pieces. We're going on a tangent now. Yes, these bracelets are Vandalay Muse and my earrings are Vandalay Muse, yes. And continuing the tangent, so this bracelet, because it's multicolored, the way it, will it show, yeah? Yes, hey, there we go. Because it's multicolored, um, to me it reminds me of vibranium. And I actually uh, reached out to my newsletter community about you know how I want to name these products and took note of that word. And actually quite a few, quite a few people were like, yes, vibranium, let's go. So uh, me being me, I was like, okay, well, before I do that, I need to do research on like, can I even use the word vibranium? Like, is that something we can all use or will Marvel get mad at me? Like, I don't know. So I checked it out and took note that the word vibranium hunt, no, vibranium hunt is trademarked with Marvel. And that's for like a computer game or something. But then the word just vibranium on its own has been trademarked by like a construction company that has nothing to do with Marvel. And I'm like, how were you able to do that? I was like, well, because it's not for entertainment, it's for a different industry, so they're allowed. I was like, what? So, I still couldn't find the complete answer to, can I just use it and you'll be okay with it? So I changed the spelling just to be on the safe side. But then in the description, I take note that this is inspired by Marvel's Vibranium. So I trust that would be okay. But I find that so fascinating. They have so many trademarks. Cause like every single character has to be trademarked, every single logo, color, everything. And I'm like, wow, that's a lot. That's a lot of work. Okay, but I digress. Anyways, trying to be a sustainable business and trying to have a sustainable lifestyle can be really overwhelming because there is an endless list of things and issues and concerns to be concerned about. I will admit before starting uh, a fashion line, I really was not particular about the fabric, my clothing, the fabric of the clothing I was purchasing. Like I really was more into like, so looking at stuff to see, is this going to fade? Is this going to shrink? If not, okay, we're good. You know, is this see-through? You know, like that, those are the types of things that I would take note of as opposed to like, what is this made of? What grade of cotton is it, you know? But then when you get into designing and then you the one who have to choose what fabric do you want and what, how many threads of this and that. And, and well, if you dye it, it will be this color, but if this fabric, it will be a different color. And I'm like, what? So as a lifestyle thing, it's like, well, do we all become minimalistic monks and dress like in the movie, The Hunger Games or Divergent or something? I don't think so. Cause that's another thing that with brands who claim to be sustainable or eco and stuff, sometimes the clothing can be really boring. Like there's no color, there's no shape because it's made out of banana peels and coffee sacks. And you know, like it's, which is cool. Like that's great that we did those different things, but why is it only gray? I don't under, like why must everything just be gray? Yeah. Then on the business standpoint, it's like, I can't solve everything like I can't save the planet by myself. I can't solve everything by myself. And then you get overwhelmed and then you're just like, you know what, forget it, stop. You know, and it's like, no, you can't stop because there's a reason why you felt called to do what you're doing, right? So maybe you can start with like, so how much paper does your business use? If it's a fashion deal, okay, what are you doing for packaging? What are you doing when you're making your stuff? Is there a whole bunch of waste or are you paying attention to what you're doing? That's why when more of us brands are coming out with like made to order and when you order, no, I'm not gonna be in your living room the next day. That It might take a week, it might take two weeks, right? But that that's how we cut down on the waste so that we don't have a whole bunch of stock that ends up in second clothing, that ends up being dumped in another country, that ends up being dumped again into the environment anyway.
Or also, how are you treating the people that work for you? How are you making sure that any, the rest of your supply chain treats the people that work for them, right? Because we don't all have our own mini factory to do everything. So those are my thoughts on what I've been experiencing and seeing when it comes to sustainability and fashion and business. I, I like to believe that we can truly be sustainable as opposed to being trendy sustainable. It would just take a lot of time because you kind of have to create, kind of have to try to create a new system as opposed to putting a little Band-Aid on something, right? Well, what do you think about this? Let me know in the comments your thoughts or if you have any other perspectives you want to add. Have you ever thought about what your clothing is made out of or where it's made? Do you even care? Let me know. Or are you, do you run a business? And I've sometimes thought, how can you actually be more sustainable with it? Let me know in the comments so we can continue the conversation. If you would like to dive deeper in this topic, I did write an article um, about this at bandeleymuse.com and you can check it out there. While you are there, I do invite you to join the, my newsletter. There's a, like a, a box thing that you can sign up on the website. And that's where I continue these types of conversations one-on-one -on -one via emails. Um, I, I really do enjoy, I really do enjoy the one-on-one -on -one interactions with my, with my subscribers. It just feels, of course, yes, it's intimate, but it feels more fulfilling. Oh no, it feels, it feels good actually, because I get to learn a little more about you as well, which is important to me because this is not only about selling, right? So you're more than welcome to check that out. Check out the article because I there's links and resources to other stats and things like that that I found uh, as well. And let me know what you think of the website because I did it. So I can constantly be tinkering with it in the back end as well. Thank you so much for watching. Be safe. I'll see you next time.